کنفرانس در سنای آمریکا 22 اسفند 98 قسمت دوم سخنرانی های سناتور لیبرمن سناتور گری پیترز سناتور کلی ایاد و سفیر میچل ریس سناتور لیبرمن دولت ایران میدانست که شیوع این ویروس در شهر مقدس قم وجود داشت اما آنها کاری در این باره نکردند زیرا میخواستند تا بعد از انتخابات منتظر بمانند تا اطمینان حاصل کنند که روی میزان مشارکت تأثیر نخواهد داشت آنها جان مردم ایران را به خاطر منافع سیاسی خودشان به خطر انداختند برای پایان رژیم چه استدلال بیشتری می توانید بکنید؟ سناتور کلیه یاد آخوندها ویروس کرونا را به خاطر مقاصد سیاسی خود پنهان کردند آنها پول ایرانیان را به جای یک سیستم بهداشتی صرف تروریسم کردند ما در کنار مردم ایران ایستاده ایم ما شعارهای آنها را شنیده ایم که مرگ بر خامنه ای خامنه ای قاتل است و ما هم این را قبول داریم سفیر میچل ریس در شیوع کرونا رژیم تهران به جای اشتراک اطلاعات با جامعه پزشکی و مردم مسئله را نادیده گرفته و لاپوشانی کرد آنها از مردم خود می ترسند نتایج رفتار آنها قمنگیز بوده است سناتور گری پیترز رژیم ایران دست به قتل عام زندانیان سیاسی زده است تظاهرات مشروع مردم را سرکوب کرده است شما شعله های مبارزه را روشن نگه می دارید تا ما مردم ایران را فراموش نکنیم ما این را به خوبی می فهمیم که رژیم ایران مردم ایران را نمایندگی نمی کند سناتور لیبرمن حمایت از مریم رجوی در ایران هر روز رشد می کند او جایگزین است و با همراهانش آماده اداری این کشور بزرگ هستند تغییر رژیم توسط مردم ایران انجام خواهد شد و آنها هستند که دولت خود را تعیین می کنند سفیر میچل ریس شورای ملی مقاومت ایران که رئیس جمهور برگزیده آن خانم مریم رجوی است آلترناتیو مشروع این رژیم است I uh, uh, enjoy to have this opportunity to, to be here, and I really appreciate this organization really standing firm uh, for the people of Iran and to know that the people of Iran and the regime of Iran are two different entities, and they have to make sure that the people of Iran have the opportunity to be able to voice uh, their opinion, to be able to have their votes count, to be able to enjoy the, the civil liberties uh, that they deserve and want. I deal with uh, Iranian issues on a, on a regular basis here as a, as a member of the Senate and particularly as a member of the Armed Services Committee. In fact, uh, just uh, earlier today, we had the commander of Central Command uh, before us talking about uh, issues uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and it's uh, no surprise to everybody here, the, folk, the Iranian regime is still engaged in uh, nefarious activities uh, throughout the Middle East, continue to engage in destabilizing efforts uh, throughout uh, that region. continue to engage in terrorist activities and if anything what we've seen in the last few months they've actually accelerated those activities over time uh, that they continue to work towards uh, a nuclear weapon now with the uh, JCPOA uh, with the United States pulling out there they're now enriching uh, uranium and continue to do that at a pace that simply is unacceptable not just what they this, this regime does uh, around uh, in the region but for decades uh, they have been directly responsible for mass ex executions of political prisoners they violently suppressed uh, peaceful protests they have sham elections so i uh, uh, have experienced or have seen firsthand how they willingly uh, uh, fail uh, to adhere to basic international obligations and basic human rights things that we take for granted here in the united states but we know you can't Uh, you have to constantly stand up to, to those who are the oppressors. So thank you for what you're doing. Congratulations uh, on celebrating another new year. And just thank you for uh, lighting the flame and making sure that we never forget that we need to stand with the people of Iran and understand that the regime does not represent the people of Iran. Thank you so much. Thank 
Thank you so much. I am so deeply honored to be here with all of you, and especially to see the bipartisan support uh, that you rightly have. I think all of us who come before you today to speak, uh, we hope that the Iranian people's wishes for this new day and this new year is that when we do come before you next year, uh, that they will have their own right to self-determination that they will rid themselves of this oppressive, evil regime that has really held them down from their freedom, from their human rights, uh, from what we all want in this world. We know, and having served on the Armed Services Committee, something that deeply troubled me. Uh, Iran is the largest state sponsor of terrorism in the world. The Iranian regime, not the Iranian people, have caused so much death and destruction. Uh, they have spent billions of dollars to fund terrorist groups that we know of that cause unrest in the Middle East, whether it's Hamas, Hezbollah, the Islamic Jihad. Uh, they've backed militia forces in Syria, Iraq, uh, and propped up the murderous Assad regime, which we know has just murdered so many of his own people, and he wouldn't have been able to do that without this horrible regime. The regime led by the Supreme Leader uh, Khamenei has spent billions of dollars uh, really just supporting evil and terrorism. And unfortunately, it has been the Iranian people who have paid the ultimate price for the money that this regime has spent causing all of this death and destruction around the world. The Iranian economy struggles, we know that. Average Iranians can't afford basic goods. And they have been denied the prosperity that we know is really the history of Iran, a very productive and prosperous people. And they're being denied that right now uh, by the Iranian regime. The Iranian people, like all people, should have the freedom to choose how they live their lives. They want what we all want, basic human rights and to be treated with dignity and respect. And we stand with the Iranian people, Republicans, Democrats, independents. This is a truly bipartisan issue. And now with Iranians struggling with the dramatic coronavirus outbreak, too many have perished. We know that's because of the regime, because they hid the virus. They thought of their own political interest. They suppressed important health information. The mullahs have spent Iranian money that should have gone to a good health care system that could help in a situation like this and instead have spent it on terrorism. So our hearts go out to the Iranians who are affected by this virus and obvious for, obviously all who are affected around the world by this virus. In the last few months, we've seen the Iranian people stand up for their rights, and we stand with them. They've taken to the streets. We've heard their chants, death to Khomeini, uh, death to the murderer and his rule, and his rule is null and void, and we agree. We know that people from all walks of life have participated in these protests, and we stand with them. Not only as we stand with the Iranians with their protests in the streets, and they should know that we have their backs, but also what can we do now? We can continue, as the Trump administration has done, to impose tougher sanctions on the regime itself, continue to expand those sanctions and to keep the pressure up at a time when we know that oil prices are dropping, when we know the economy is struggling, when we know that they are on the edge and we need to keep that pressure up to help those who are protesting their own government. The mullahs only understand and respond to strength. That is why it was important that President Trump took out Qasem Soleimani. As has already been said by Senator Lieberman and others, he had the blood of so much blood on his hands. Taking out Soleimani was certainly a blow to the regime and a setback, but we cannot be naive about this. In October of this year, what will happen 
If we do not act, if we do not push for snap snapback, if the world does not push back, Iran, the arms embargo against Iran will be lifted. Well, I would say today, what can we work on as we think about what we need to accomplish before the fall is to really focus on making sure that the arms embargo is not lifted on Iran, that the sanctions are snapped back. And finally, that we continue to hold Iran accountable for all of its human rights violations, as every speaker up here has said today. Uh, this is a time where we have an opportunity to come together to continue the maximum pressure campaign to make sure that there is, the people have the right to regime change in Iran and that they can live in freedom and prosperity. I want to thank you so much for having me uh, here today. We very much, our hearts go out to the Iranian people, but we know that they are strong and we know at the end of the day that their voices will prevail and that they will determine their history, not this current regime. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nowruz Mubarak, right? Happy, happy Nowruz. And uh, in the midst of a very difficult time in everyone's lives, the world is unsettled, the virus is uh, spreading. And here we are with all the hope of the seven S's, the half C, uh, to remind us of the uh, e eternality of life on earth and also remind us in a more uh, direct way about why we're here, that uh, this is, Nauru's is a celebration that goes back millennia, thousands of years. And it reminds us that uh, this uh, extremist, uh, violent group that seized control of Iran in uh, 1979 is really an aberration, a, a temporary aberration in the history, the great, proud, long, civilized history of the Persian people. And with your help and our government's help, we will return to the right course of Persian history, which is expressed here in this room today. We can make it happen, and we will. There is at least one issue that remains bipartisan or nonpartisan, and that is the American people standing with the people of Iran in behalf of their freedom and justice there. And we will continue to do that until they receive full justice and freedom. Uh, a new day is dawning in Iran today, and it's not just um, wishful thinking. Uh, it's, uh, it's a fact, uh, and I want to recite some of the events that have come together to give me uh, the hope, based on reality, that the regime in uh, Tehran is rotting, literally. It's collapsing, and the people of Iran are rising with extraordinary courage to take back their freedom and their opportunity. Now, now, why do I say that? And I'll just go back over the last six months since we gathered last year uh, on, on the last uh, Nauru's. Uh, let's go back to November. Been mentioned uh, briefly, but the tripling of uh, oil prices and the uh, courage of the people to come out into the streets and to protest and the brutality of the regime led by uh, Soleimani, uh, an, an international war criminal, really, uh, to, uh, who, who, who brought, because they were protesting, asserting their rights, uh, took action to kill um, hundreds of them, as you know. Uh, that was November. Uh, then we go to uh, January. 
and Soleimani got uh, what he uh, deserved, which was death at the hand of the United States military. And I, I, I don't say that lightly. It, it mattered uh, not just most of all as it did to the people of Iran, it mattered to the people of America. Soleimani had the blood of hundreds of Americans on his hands, more than 600 by calculation of our own Defense Department who were soldiers in Iraq and thousands of Iranian citizens and hundreds of thousands more uh, where the IRGC uh, has been bringing extremism, terrorism, and violence throughout the Middle East, particularly in places like uh, Syria and Iraq and Yemen and Gaza and uh, Libya. He went to a death that uh, he uh, deserved. The, the reaction to that, of course, was the uh, protests of People, uh, people in Iran, again, having the courage to come out in the streets and say that the country was better off um, without him. Uh, and uh, then, of course, the shooting down of the uh, Ukrainian airliner, which again brought university students out to uh, protest. And, and then we go to the elections in February. And uh, there's been talk of this before, but Quite startling, really, the, um, the regime, as has been said, pressured people, saying o almost that it was, it was the, the religious duty of people uh, in Iran to come out and vote. Uh, at one point, one of the leaders in the regime said, if the turnout here is not good in this election, it will make our enemies happy. 42.5% turnout, according to the official report, uh, the estimates, as you've heard, are ultimately that 90% of the eligible voters in Iran didn't uh, vote. And that, that really was the people speaking with their feet about what they hope for and pray for and are prepared to risk their lives for, which is the end of the Islamic Republic of Iran as we have known it for 40 years. It can happen. And now the latest uh, current, and, and Mrs. Maryam Rajavi, who, who spoke very clearly to the people of Iran, incidentally, in, in the campaign leading up to the elections, and uh, pleaded with people not to vote, uh, because a vote would be a vote in favor of uh, the Ayatollah, the supreme leader of, the, uh, of Rouhani and the, and the clerical regime. And I think the people in Iran heard Mrs. Rajavi's voice, and that's one of the reasons they didn't come out to vote. But let's talk about the coronavirus that's on everybody's mind, really everybody in the world, everywhere in the world. And look at how this government in Tehran handled it. We know now that the government in Iran knew that there was an outbreak of this virus in the holy city of Qom, but they did nothing about it because they wanted to wait until after the election uh, to make sure that uh, the turnout would not be affected. In other words, they risked the lives of the people of Iran for their own political benefit. Uh, how much more of an argument could you make for the end uh, of a regime? And throughout this entire period, the Iranian airliner, Mahan Airways, Air, Mahan Air, owned, controlled by the IRGC, has continued to fly daily back and forth to China. There's some reason to believe that the disease may have broken out, the virus may have broken out in uh, uh, Iran because of the movement of Chinese students from China to uh, Iran to study and back and forth, but it's outrageous. When you think about it, Mahan Air uh, continues to fly every day back and forth between Iran and China. And again, this says that the IRGC puts its own business interests ahead of the human interests 
of the people of Iran. The people get this, and uh, that's why are they, they are demanding change. So the question is, what now for policy from the United States of America? We have to support a change of the regime in Iran to the people of Iran to finally exercise their own self-government. That, that is what we're about. And we don't, the United States can't do that and won't do that. But the people of Iran will do it. And then the question is, how do we react? Uh, do we stand by and muzzle ourselves? Or do we speak out in support uh, of the people of Iran and the support of American values of, of universal human rights. Um, Dr. King said famously that the moral arc of the universe bends slowly, but it always bends toward justice. I believe that, and I'd add, it always bends toward freedom, but um, we have the capacity to uh, bend that arc more quickly. And honestly, the people in this room uh, can make it happen if we work together to finally bring about what we want, a new day in Iran, and not to listen to people who say, uh, oh, regime change will lead to chaos as it did in Syria or Le Libya or Yemen. Part of why it won't lead to chaos is that um, Iran uh, is the one who caused a lot of the chaos in those other countries. And um, part of the reason is that there is an alternative uh, in Iran that's ready to govern. And that is the National Council of Resistance in Iran. Uh, President-elect Mrs. Maryam Rajavi, uh, her support, I believe, in Iran grows every day. She is the alternative. We have an old phrase in American politics, you can't beat somebody with nobody. Uh, in Iran, there is somebody and some buddies around that somebody who are prepared uh, to govern this great country and return, its, return it uh, to its traditions. So uh, let us hope and pray, but not just hope and pray, and work that uh, next Nauru's, 2021, we can say, not that a new day is near, but that a Naros, a new day, has begun for the people of Iran and the proud people of Persia. Thank you very, very much. Great pleasure to be here among you again. I want to talk briefly this afternoon about the recent parliamentary elections in Iran, what they mean for the people of Iran, and what they mean for us going forward. As you all know, on February 21, Iran held the first round of parliamentary elections. Almost 58 million Iranians were eligible to vote. And the people were told repeatedly that it was their duty to vote. Not voting was the equivalent of treason, they were warned. The nationwide boycott of the election was a rebuke to the regime and a signal that the Iranian people are no longer willing to accept rule by this government. It was also a signal to us and the other members of the international community that the Iranian people are willing to defy the regime and take brave and courageous steps to build a real democracy one that represents their interests and respects their dignity. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, why did he choose to do so now, at this point in time? The conclusion I draw is that this sham election is a sign of the regime's weakness, not strength. Over the past few months, the regime has been further weakened by a series of defeats and setbacks. Last November, fuel prices inside Iran tripled sparking protests and riots across the country. 
On one day, protests were reported in 165 cities in Iran. The people involved came not just from the middle classes, but also from the lower classes of Iranian society, including the unemployed and farmers, people the regime previously had counted on for its support. In order to suppress the voice of the people and restore order, the regime resorted to the tool that it knows best, violence. Within a matter of days, the IRGC killed over 1,500 Iranians. On January 3rd, a U.S. airstrike killed Qasem Soleimani, the commander of the Quds Force, and the right hand of Ayatollah Khamenei. Days later, the IRGC shot down a Boeing 737 civilian airliner operated by the Ukrainian International Airlines as it was taking off from Tehran Airport. All 176 people on board, including numerous Iranians, were killed. The February parliamentary elections took place against this backdrop. Wounded by these events, the regime could not risk another setback. When a government doesn't trust its own people, it's a sign of grave weakness, not strength. We've seen this again with respect to the coronavirus outbreak, where Tehran ignored and covered up the problem rather than share the information with the medical community and the Iranian people. They were afraid of their own citizens. And here again, the results of their behavior have been tragic. Today, we see an authoritarian regime in Tehran that is in crisis. We see an authoritarian regime that is fundamentally illegitimate. We see an authoritarian regime that is unwilling to tell the truth to its own people. We see an authoritarian regime that uses violence indiscriminately. And above all, we see Madame Rajavi and the National Council of Resistance in Iran as a viable democratic alternative that best expresses the hopes and aspirations of all the Iranian people who want to breathe free. We see all that. And so we see a better future for Iran and the Iranian people someday soon.